We are glad to see you here uh, on our uh, new uh, online event. Today we will talk to Jan van Yoon, uh, a great friend of SL. Sorry, I will put off notifications. Um, okay. Um, so we will meet Jan van Yoon, the IO Golden Medalist of the Year 2018 and uh, New Zealand team leader. Uh, of uh, 2019. Uh, he is currently studying in Stanford and today he will tell us um, everything about, about it and cover all the topics mentioned by those who registered for our session. So, hi, uh, how are you doing? Oh, hi. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm doing great. Um, yeah, so it's nice to be here. Um, I'm currently in New Zealand. I'm currently on my summer break um, in New Zealand, uh, coming back to my first year at Stanford. So yeah, I'm doing great. Yeah, how are you doing, Valeria? I'm fine. Uh, I'm, in, uh, I'm in Moscow. And um, actually, we have a huge difference of time zones. And it's currently evening in New Zealand. And it's morning in Russia. It's midday. So um, the IO is really global and all around the world. Mm, yeah, for sure. Yes, yeah, it's, it's very cool. Um, yeah, so it's currently like nighttime right now, 10 p.m. It's currently raining quite hard. Um, but yeah, like it's great to be here. So let's start. Uh, and uh, please describe the timeline of whole journey from high school to the IO in Stanford in uh, some points. Yeah, so um, basically, as I mentioned, so I grew up in New Zealand. I went to high school in New Zealand. So I went to a large public co-educational high school. So um, yeah, so I thought it was a really good high school opportunity. So in year 13, so my last year of high school, I found out about um, the International Economics Olympiad. Um, from a friend. So basically, um, because it was the first Olympiad, there wasn't that much preparation coming in for me. Um, so I just basically went on the website, I did a lot of research myself, and I did a lot of studying myself. And then so, um, you know, um, like we formed a team to go to the Olympiad, we didn't have a selection like criteria then because of the because it was so new and because it was so recent. So basically, we just formed a team and then we came over to, to Moscow um, to compete. And you know, I was very fortunate to um, have had a really great team had really good support from my teachers. And, I'll, and because of that, I was able to um, very fortunately score a gold medal as well as the top, um, like top score in the economic section. And um, that was, I think, a large reason why I was able to be successful in high school, ultimately, as you mentioned. So um, that was the middle of my year 13 because of the way in which the Southern Hemisphere works. So we start our year in February and we end the year in November. And so I applied to like, you know, a lot of US universities and UK universities, et cetera. Um, like at the end of year 13 so in about like december and i was very lucky to be accepted into stanford amongst other universities and i ultimately chose stanford and i attended since last year september so i currently finished my first year at stanford um undergraduate okay uh, so i think you already described but um can you choose some important events or incidents which shape you towards achieving your success achieving stanford yeah, so definitely finding out about the International Economics Olympiad was one of the biggest, um, like I think one of the most important events looking back um, in my high school. So um, I actually was able to read my admissions files. So why I got into Stanford, um, you know, when I was there. So basically like I mentioned that the fact that I was a gold medalist at the Olympiad and scored the highest, you know, um, scored the highest, like had the highest score in the economic section um, the year I competed was actually a really big reason why they thought I had the academic rigor to get in. Um, so that was a big reason. I also participated in a lot of activities um, during my um, high school years. So I did a lot of debating. Uh, I did a lot of um, like different Olympiads. I, I, I was involved in my youth councils. Um, I did some like biological research and medical research. So I was quite involved in a number of areas. And I think just being involved in doing what, what I loved in high school was really, a, was really one of the biggest factors in pushing me into, I guess, like, um, you know, being able to um, be, I guess, successful. Okay, uh, so there were uh, several questions connected with the cost of studying and is it actually worth it? Um, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, so the, the, the um, face value cost of studying is definitely quite high. So um, objectively speaking, 
um, like if you don't have any financial aid or scholarships, et cetera, um, you know, the cost is, is about 80,000 US dollars a year. So including like tuition and housing fees and accommodation. And also they include like living costs. So the estimation from Stanford is it'll cost you about $80,000 a year to attend. Um, having said that, like, um, and I think, you know, this will come to your next question about scholarships. So I won't mention it now, but um, even if you pay the full cost, I think if you are able to afford it, I think it is worth it, but it is up to you to make the value for yourself, right? Um, like ultimately, I think the value of having, you know, a like really nice degree is like, you know, only so high. I think it's the friendships that you make and the relationships you make with professors and with talented people. I think, you know, university and college anywhere is what you make of it. And if you take the full opportunities and um, make the full grasp and carpe, carpe diem, I guess, um, I think that's exactly what makes the value. Um, so yeah, like if you sit around and do nothing and only do the bare minimum at university, like surely it won't be worth it. Um, and you'd rather want to go to a cheaper university. Um, but yeah, like I think if you are able to make full use of the opportunities that are available to you, then I think it is worth it. So there was also a question uh, that sounded like, uh, is uh, there any things that you can get only from, uh, from Stanford? And uh, I think that community is one of such things. Yes? Yes. Uh, so, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, so, more like that, uh, something that you can get only at Stanford. Okay, yeah, so I think there's quite a few things that you can only get, uh, well, like, it's very easy to get um, as in a US university and also um, especially at Stanford. So in terms of US universities in general, I think some of the best things is that you live on campus. So you're basically involved, you basically li live with all your friends, you have that freedom and you have the high levels of interaction and connection that you have with, you know, everyone around you and you are in that immersive environment. Um, secondly, you have the liberal arts curriculum. So you're not only like, you know, just because I applied to study economics doesn't mean I'm like, you know, have to study all economics papers for all four years. Um, I'm able to explore what I want to do. Um, I'm actually a computer science major right now. So I'm basically doing a lot of computer science because, you know, even though I didn't do any computer science before coming into university, because of that liberal arts curriculum, I'm able to explore my interests and do things I would never have imagined before coming into college. Um, I think especially at Stanford, um, which what I think is really cool is obviously the really, really talented people because, um, you know, it's a, it's a really great university and, you know, it takes a lot of top students. So there's a lot of talented people and motivated people and being surrounded by them also makes you more motiva motivated. Um, also like the location in Silicon Valley, um, definitely quite nice. Like basically um, you're surrounded by opportunities, by startups, um, Facebook and Google are down the road, Apple is up the road. Um, it's just a really great opportunity, especially if you're interested in taking computer science, but also areas like economics and finance. There's a great like deal of research. So if you want to have a research position with really great professors, that's really easy to get, or you know, relatively easy to get because you're in such close proximity to them. So it's just a lot of really exciting things happening that I think would be very difficult to come by anywhere else. Yeah, great. And please tell us about your scholarship. Do you have one? And what are the scholarship opportunities at Stanford? Yeah, so I think in terms of academic or merit scholarships, there are very, very little. So um, the few like, you know, like um, financial, I guess, um, supports I have would be like, for example, a few small scholarships that I got from New Zealand, um, from like, you know, the government, from my school, um, from my local communities. Um, but obviously they're not they're very much. And, you know, compared to the very high cost of attending university, um, basically Stanford, because of how hard it already is to get into the university, they can't really differentiate between who to give merit scholarships to, right? So it's hard to give the very, very, very top students, um, you know, scholarships when everyone's already very good. Um, I think what Stanford offers and what, I think that's also the case for most universities in the US. So um, I think there's a few exceptions. So for example, the Robertson Scholarship at Duke, um, a lot of merit scholarships at USC, at um, you know, many other universities, but I think those are the minority. Most universities will only, won't give any merit-based scholarships. Um, so like the way in which most, like obviously, like basically if you get into Stanford, however, they like they won't, like if you can't pay for it, they won't make you pay for it. So there's a lot of really generous financial aid. Um, so like basically if your family earns under a certain amount of money, um, basically like they'll pay for you, right? So um, I think it's quite generous. Um, like I have a lot of friends who basically pay nothing to go to university. Um, and I think it's really, really cool. Um, so, you know, Stanford wants to work with you. If you do get in, 
um, like basically Stanford wants you to attend. So they will make it very easy. Like they will try to their best to make it quite easy for you to be able to afford it and for your family to be able to afford it. Um, so that's not something to worry about too much if you do get in. Having said that, um, Stanford is need aware for international students. So if you don't have a US citizenship, um, they would take the fact that you need financial aid into account. So that might make getting it a little bit more difficult um, if you do need you know, financial aid in order to attend Stanford. Um, but you know, many other universities like Harvard, like Yale and Princeton aren't are need blind, which means that regardless of whether or not you need financial aid or not, it's still you know, equally, I guess, easy or difficult to get in, um, if that makes sense. Um, I think that the other thing to preface is that um, there are like, if you're getting in because of athletics, so if, you, um, if, if you're like basically a world-class like soccer player or a world-class like baseball player, et cetera, um, then there are scholarship opportunities there for your athletics. Um, but that's obviously a very different route. Um, it's a minority of routes um, and it's not something that I really have much information on. But if that's something you're interested in, you should look mm -hmm. into that. Yeah. So it's like another kind of Olympic Games. We had International Economics Olympiad, and if you're an actual Olympics Games winner, you can enter Stanford with some kind of, of scholarship. Okay, great. So yeah. hard work pays off at Stanford, as I see. And um, please tell uh, us uh, about SAT and Common App Essay. Any tips from you, how you managed to write them successfully and all this stuff? Yeah, so I think, um, so firstly, let's look at the SAT. So basically, um, a lot of universities in the US require you to take either the SAT or the ACT, as well as maybe the SAT subject tests, which show your like, like how good you are at specific subjects. So like biology or chemistry or math. Um, so the SAT and the ACT first are like, basically very similar sub like tests. So they basically test your general like multiple choice, um, like your math, your basic math, your basic reading, your basic like comprehension skills, and so basically, like, I think um, it used to be the case that all universities require it and take it quite seriously, but because of the coronavirus, because of the difficulty testing, um, a lot of universities are dropping this requirement now. And I think that's an increasing trend. So it's becoming a lot less important um, because, you know, it's only just a test, right? Um, but I think, you know, the, mo the main important things in the SAT or ACT to do well is, you know, very simple. So it's nothing you don't already know. So it's practice, make sure do, you do quite a few practice tests to make sure exactly what they're testing and how they're testing it. Uh, make sure you, you know, understand your high school syllabus. So you need the basic math skills and the basic English comprehension skills to be able to, you know, do it well. Um, and like, yeah, make sure that um, you're able to like grasp the basic concepts and the things that they're testing. So I think it's quite simple actually. So as long as you have the fundamentals down, it shouldn't really be a problem. Um, it wasn't really a problem for me. I only took it once. I did a few days of study um, and you know, it, it's, it's ultimately okay. Um, universities don't really take that much consideration into it unless you do really, really badly. Um, yeah, so in terms of the common app, um, yeah, so the Common App essay is like one of the many essays that you would have to write to get into a university. The thing about the Common App is that it's the one essay that all schools share. So you write this essay for all schools and then the supplementary essays go to a specific school. So you would write multiple supplementary essays. The Common App essay, um, I guess it's about 650 words at a maximum. So it's a very short essay, to be very honest. Um, you want to show, um, you know, a part of yourself. So I think a recommendation from me would be to show a small slice of your life that's quite meaningful and that shows who you are and that shows a very personal side of yourself aside from all your achievements. So show yourself as like basically show you what you're passionate about or show um, how like insightful you are or perceptive you are and show how you, you like your thought processes go I guess. So it can be about anything to be honest. Um, there's a wide range of topics and the six like prompt is literally any topic of your choice. So you can do anything you want. Um, but yeah, just show you how interesting you are and why a school, aside from your achievements, would want to take you in because you're such a cool person. Okay, uh, so is it hard for a foreigner to be accepted in a college in the US, especially uh, at Stanford, for example, at high class universities? Yeah, so I think um, like there's a couple of things here. So it's just, like in general, it's just I think it's quite difficult if you're an international without US citizenship to get into uni these universities in the first place for any university in the US. So um, like I think like the acceptance rates definitely say that. So like the acceptance rate would be slightly lower for foreigners than for US citizens. Um, I think there's a number of reasons like, you know, it's very difficult. Like, for, for example, um, a lot of people like a lot of foreigners 
um, may have trouble, like for example, getting the English proficiency up um, to be able to compete. Um, you know, a lot of the US admissions counselors may not be able to, um, you know, understand the foreign curriculum as well as the AP or the IP system, etc. Um, so it's a lot of like very innocuous reasons, as well as the fact that, you know, they might just want more US students. Um, the fact, um, especially, this is especially the case with public schools. So for example, like um, University of California schools, um, like, you know, University of Michigan, like these sort of like public schools, even top public schools, they would tend to, um, you know, prefer to take in-state students rather than out-of-state students because basically they're, state, they're serving their state, right? Um, which is very fair. And so like, it's definitely harder to for out-of-state and also for foreigners to get into these universities. Um, thirdly, as I mentioned, so especially at Stanford, um, if you need to apply for financial aid, um, financial aid, like acceptances are need aware for, for foreigners and need blind for domestic students. So if you're a foreigner and you need aid, it's definitely not a lot harder to get in than if you're a foreigner and don't need aid or if you're you know, a domestic student and need aid, if that makes sense. So yeah, there's a number of reasons why um, like getting in as a foreigner is definitely a bit harder than for a domestic student, but it's definitely still possible. Okay. Um... <clears throat> And uh, the next question is not uh, straightly connected to Stanford, but uh, it's about your experience in general. How do you maintain a balance between schoolwork and other activities? Is it hard? Because I, su I suppose that uh, at Stanford, it's really hard to, uh, like, to find t some time for yourself, for other activities. So tell us, please. Yeah, I think like... Um... Like, I think once you get into these universities, like, life is actually quite, like, nice. Like, I think it's actually quite enjoyable. So, um, like, I think the university doesn't really, like, it depends on the university, but, mo like, a lot of really good universities is more like it's hard to get into, but once you're there, they want you to explore. They want you to have the freedom to, like, start your own company, to do the next big thing, to do what you love. Um, because ultimately, that's, like, probably a lot more important than, you know, the academic content that you have to, like, do, right? Um, like they want you to make friends and they want you to have these connections and so i guess like um yeah so like definitely the work is quite hard and like you want to work hard to make sure your grades are up but yeah you can you definitely have time to do what you love um you can do your extracurricular activities you can um interact with people that you want to hang out with um all these sorts of things um but i think in high school if you want to talk about it at, at that as well i think you know it's definitely a lot more rigorous to get into universities um, so you, obviously you want to be pushing yourself quite hard and to manage your time quite well in order to get into these universities. You want to um, have these, I think what's really important in general is to have like really clear goals in mind. So you, you know you want this specifically and so you would naturally in your mind have steps to achieve that goal. So if I know, so for example, I knew that I wanted to go to a top US, US university and so that's why I was like, um, to do that, I need to do well in this and that and that. And then I, you know, created sub goals and just made sure I was very clear with myself that like what I had to do. And that makes it so much easier to be motivated to achieve it. Um, okay, so, um, and another question is a, a quite interesting one. Is it possible to get to the top university if you are not a straight A student? Because it's not relevant for you because you are a total overachiever and you have all the high marks, but still, maybe you have some examples uh, from your friends experience like this. And um, so just in general. Um, yeah, I think um, like ultimately like universities are a, um, like uh, academic institutions first and foremost. So they definitely do care about your grades. Um, but like having said that, um, I don't think your grades are the end all and be all. I think um, it depends, for example, like um, I think universities, especially US universities, um, like they, uh, they, they accept people that are like just interesting people, right? They, they wanna create a diverse class. So it would be a very boring class had everyone be, if everyone is just a straight A student and that's all they are. They want to like, so but like, I think if you're not a straight A student, it's definitely still possible to get in. And it's still like, you know, not very difficult to get in as long as you're an interesting person. So if you're like, if you're not a straight A student, but you're really interesting because you're really interested in, you know, like dance, or you're really interested in um, social justice, and you're really interested in community involvement, um, that's definitely a really interesting thing to do. And it's really meaningful and universities are interested and that's how you can get in. Um, so like, you know, so I don't think, universities only care about your grades. And just because you have a B on your transcript doesn't mean you can't get in. Um, but ultimately, like, 
university is hard. It's ultimately where you go to learn things and you're challenged academically above anything else. And you still, you know, like they still want you to be able to keep up with your work. Um, so, you know, you still have to maintain a certain level of grades. Um, what this level is depends on for different universities, right? So I'd imagine that really, really academically rigorous universities like MIT, U Chicago, and like Caltech, where it's a lot more focused on the academics would require high levels of like, you know, Olympiad medals and like, like really high GPAs, etc. But like, you know, like Stanford is a relatively chilled university. Um, the more focus is on your holistic um, achievements. And I think the, the requirements would be lower naturally. Um, I think the caveat to that is that um, you want to be able to show that you're taking full use of academic opportunities. So you want to show that um, you want to show these universities that in high school you took you took the most rigorous like course load possible and to, in order to challenge yourself. Um, you want to make sure that you did things that were outside the classroom to challenge yourself. Um, so it's not like you don't have to get straight A's, but universities want to see that you were able to challenge yourself fully and were able to make sure that like, you know, you're making full use of the opportunities and working hard to make sure that those opportunities um, are succeeding. Okay, and is it hard to maintain a high GPA at Stanford? Um, I think like it depends on your circumstances and it depends on your major and all, all these different things. But I think, um, you know, a lot of universities in the US start do suffer from grade inflation. So, you know, the average GPA at Stanford is actually quite high. Um, you know, it's about an A minus um, to an like A minus ish. So it's definitely like, um, you know, the average GPA is, you know, not that low, but like definitely like, for example, um, if you take very difficult classes, if, you know, for example, um, you know, d depending on people's circumstances, um, you know, it could be hard to maintain a very high GPA. But like, I think um, in general, Stanford is, um, a lot, like a lot more forgiving, um, in terms of academics and in terms of your GPA than a lot of other universities, um, that I, that I know of. And can you please tell us a little bit more about your major? Uh, what is it about? And uh, because you have MSE, and what is that? It's quite new for uh, us, for example. Yeah, no worries. So basically, um, my plans right now are like I'm I'm basically undecided because that's part of the beauty of the US education system, right? Like your liberal arts education means that um, you don't really know what, like you, you, can, you can come in without knowing what you want to do. And that's part of the process of finding out. So like I came in wanting to do economics, wanting to do like human biology, but I've quickly found out that, you know, computer science is really, really interesting. And I'm really interested in computer science. So currently like I'm pursuing a major maybe in computer science. And um, hopefully in the future, I would like to do either a double major or a co-term in fact, in either computer science and also in um, you know management science and engineering, which is MSNE. So management science engineering, I think, is a uniquely standard thing, and so it's basically a mix, as you can imagine, of like management, so economics and operations and finance, et cetera, of science, so basically general science, so you know your basic physics and your chemistry, and basically your you know scientific concepts, and also engineering, so being able to know you know like engineering concepts like optimization, um, like you know like just in general, like being able to solve problems. And so like, it's just, it's basically a very general major, it's a very general like sort of subject area. Um, but I think, you know, it's a great mix of things that I really enjoy. Yeah. Okay, and how do you like uh, distance learning at Stanford uh, due to the pandemic? What is your experience about it? Yeah, so basically um, I didn't, so Stanford is on a quarter system where you attend three quarters of the year. So normally that is your, fall quarter or autumn quarter and your winter quarter and then your spring quarter. So I basically came back to New Zealand um, end of my winter quarter. So I did my spring quarter online. And so basically, um, I think the experience was quite interesting. Um, I think there's a number of things that made it quite like interesting. So Stanford actually was very kind and they made it a universal pass system. So a pass fail system. So basically there's no grades because, you know, they, and also there were no exams to make sure that, you know, to ensure fear, fairness, right? Because it's not fair that I have to wake up at 4.30 in the morning to take an exam because I live in a different time zone. Um, but like, yeah, so like class attendance for anything was all like non-mandatory, um, which is fair because then other, because of time zones, right? Um, so basically I attended like none of my classes because they were all early in the morning um, before I woke up. And, um, but yeah, so I think it's definitely quite an interesting experience. Um, I think it's obviously it's not as great as being on campus and you know that's obviously the biggest part of going to college and going to university is interacting with people and professors 
Um, there was a lot of that lacking, unfortunately. Um, but I think Stanford did, you know, probably as well as it could in terms of, you know, maintaining, um, you know, high levels of learning as best as it could in these circumstances. Okay, and now I will have to stop uh, while we have uh, five minutes. Maybe we'll check the Q&A section. Um, yeah. Okay, so... Um, okay, uh, Anonymous wants to know how many U.S. colleges did you apply to? Okay, so I, from what I remember, I applied to like somewhere between eight and ten. So basically, I didn't apply to very many. Um, I have many friends that applied to like 22 or plus. I think the Common App itself allows you to apply to a maximum of 20 and you can apply to like schools outside the Common App, like UCs or like MIT, um, et cetera, right? So um, I applied to only H H10 schools. Um, you know, uh, I thought, my thought process was that I would only want to attend, um, you know, the very best universities because otherwise I have great options, you know, in the UK, in New Zealand, in Australia um, that were a lot cheaper. Um, and I thought that would be the best use of my like time and money or my parents' money as well. And so I applied to, um, yeah, so eight to 10, not very many. I also like started very late in the process. So I only gave myself a few weeks to apply to universities. Um, so yeah, like eight to 10. Okay. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, non-academic activities in Stanford? at Stanford? Are you involved in something, um, maybe some kind of sports or like this? Yeah, so like one of the activities that I'm involved in at Stanford is STEM consulting. And it's a really interesting activity in that um, I, like it's basically like a pre-professional group for like, you know, management consultants, right? So basically it's one of the only clubs on campus where you get to work with, you know, off campus, uh, where you get to work with real life, you know, clients. So, and, you know, we get revenue from that. Um, so basically, for example, um, one of the clients, so we worked with two clients, one per quarter, so one for four quarter, one for winter quarter, sorry, and one for spring quarter. And um, that basically allowed us to, you know, actually solve these problems and do management consulting and actually work with these clients in a, you know, in a really real way that, you know, McKinsey or IBCG would, I guess. So that gave us a really good training into how to do that. And so I really learned a lot from that. I thought it was a really ex interesting experience. And, you know, that's one of the main clubs I'm involved with on campus. Okay, great. And we have like three minutes left. So I would like to ask you to give some advices to future IEO participants. And as well, uh, as far as I know, uh, some team leaders are also watching this. So uh, on the behalf of former participants and team leader, wish something, please. Uh, yeah, so like in terms of tips, I guess, um, you know, I don't really have that many. I think um, being a participant is a, a really great experience. Um, you know, like, I think if you want to do well in the competition, obviously it's very like, you know, it's very straightforward. You just read the content. So make sure you're like, you're reading, you know, the, the two books on the syllabus, make sure you're covering everything, make sure you do the past papers, um, make sure you're like, you know, you're like all three parts of your competition are good. So make sure your economics, your finance, and also your, you know, your team competition skills um, and your communication skills are really tops. Um, I think, you know, ultimately it's great to do well in competitions, great to win medals, but you want to also be able to make the friends and to, you know, interact with people. I think that's one of the more important bits as well. Um, in terms of being a team leader, honestly, like, um, you know, I don't know if like, like basically like, like my team was quite great. So I didn't really manage my team very much, but yeah. So I think it's also a really great experience. You get to, you know, um, you know, interact with, you know, talented students all around the world, you know, talented professionals and, you know, educators all around the world and, you know, being able to interact with, with these people is, I think, Personally, it's a lot less stressful than being a participant, having been both. You don't have to like, you know, do these competitions, but you do have to worry about the safety of your team, etc. Um, but ultimately, yeah, like either way, the Olympiad is a great experience and um, yeah, just have fun and meet people. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much. You are right on time. So thank you for being with us. And um, we will post the recording of this uh, lecture on our YouTube. You can watch it later. And thank, thank you for joining us. And good luck to all the participants of the I.O. And good luck with your studying at Stanford. And thank you so much again. Yeah, thank you. No worries. Yeah.